What is happening, everyone? Welcome to Mailbag Monday, number 14. Guys, thanks so much for tuning in. If you have a question for me and would like to have your question featured on Mailbag Monday, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. And in the subject, be sure to put Mailbag Monday. And that way, I will kind of be drawn towards your email and maybe we'll feature it on an episode of Mailbag Monday. Guys, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. We got a bunch of great questions for you today so let's dive right in without any further ado i love this one this one had me thinking which is it's it's hard on the brain compartments down here so we got uh hi mike i'm going to crete in a few weeks and will no doubt be spending some time on the beach with the xyl that sounds lovely i'll be taking my small qrp hf rig the discovery tx 500 but don't know what antenna to use it has to be small and not take up much space on the ground with counterpoise wires as, as the beach will probably be pretty busy it will in fact be teeming with people who want to walk through your antenna field yes can can you recommend something so I, I put a lot of thought into this and, and the answer didn't immediately come to me after thinking, okay, well, what can you use for HF? You know, could, could you use a vertical like a wolf of recoils? Well, no, you still have the counterpoise wires. Could you put up an NFED or a dipole? Well, then you have places that you need to support it. And even if you get the wire in a tree, there's still, there's still a lot of risk there. And then it dawned on me, the magic antenna that you should get is the mag loop. The humble mag loop. No counterpoise wires. Heck, hardly any wires to, to begin with. It's it's coax. It's just a loop. It can sit on the desk. There's no counterpoise. There's no 100-foot wires going out. They're great for QRP. This one, I think, is, is from Chameleon. This is their F-Loop 3.0. Uh, now, they're not cheap, but uh, I've, I've been told they work uh, pretty darn well for what they are. I've not personally used one yet. Uh, I do have one coming at some point to try out, but uh, that right there is going to solve the problem. And, and I think uh, for a lot of kind of space restricted areas, the, the mag loop should suit you quite well. So the, the next hurdle is swallowing the price tag. I think this chameleon one runs for about $500. Uh, there's another one, alpha antennas, I believe. Might be a little bit cheaper. I'm not sure on the cost, but yeah, they're... They're in that like price of the radio range for what seems to be very little components. I think it's like RG213 coax and probably a capacitor and a tuning knob. And, and uh, I don't think there's really much in them, but boy, they sure have a price tag. So uh, I, I can't think of anything that would be better than that other than just putting out uh, counterpoise wires and watching all the tourists trip over them, which could have its own bit of fun in and of itself. But... Go get yourself a mag loop. And great question. Thanks for uh, writing in. Next is another great question. One that I had an easier answer for. Having to do with masts for a hamstick dipole. He's writing, uh, I tried home brewing one from two lengths of a quarter inch PVC, but it seemed too wobbly for the weight. Uh, all the commercial ones are hundreds of dollars. Yeah, which, which I don't want to spend unless there's no other alternative. Well, my friend, there is another alternative. And he's talking about uh, portable uh, hamstick dipole for, for parks on the air. Go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever uh, home improvement stores in your area and search for a telescopic painter's pole. This is what my dad used on his RV for his hamstick dipole. You can see it's $40. And if you're in the Home Depot at Huntsville, Texas, they have them in stock so you can walk in and buy one right off the shelf for very, very few of your hard-earned dollars. So rigid enough, you know, you got to think 20 feet up in the air, you're painting. Uh, they, they should be able to hold you up your dipole, no problem. That's an easy one. Come on, you got anything harder for me? <laughs> Thanks for writing in, buddy. Next question, we're going back in the car for mobile antenna questions. This viewer is writing, I'm considering installing an 891 in my SUV. So first off, don't consider, do. And I'm considering antenna options. Those are a little bit more to consider. I have a mag mount with a shark ham stick currently, but looking for a more fixed install. What are your thoughts on the screwdriver antennas Tar Heel versus ATOS? And what should I consider with installing mobile HF? So we'll get to the antennas in a second. 
As far as what to consider when installing, obviously you have the 891, so really the only things to consider are how you're gonna power it. Me personally, I cannot get through the firewall in my car to wire it up to the battery, so I had to jerry-rig away to get the cigarette lighter to power it. I also do use a lithium iron phosphate battery when I'm just sitting at a park, so I'm not pulling power from the battery itself. Uh, the other things to consider would be simply how you're going to mount it and where. Uh, I've seen some nice installs where guys will put uh, the radio right on their dash. Some guys don't want to put anything sticky or screw through their dash. So uh, I've kind of done a little bit of both myself for my HF radio. I use a Lido mount and I'm very, very happy with that. I did a video on uh, that a couple months ago and it's fantastic. Uh, I have the 891 myself, so I can, I can speak very highly about the Lido mounts. Now getting to the antennas, there's... Uh, there's some similarities and there's some differences. So let's go out to this video that I shot outside and I will show you the differences between the ATOS and the Tar Heel. So hopefully you can decide for yourself. Take it away, Mike. So let's take a look at both antennas. On your left, this is the little Tar Heel 2. And on your right, this is the Yesu ATOS. Now, in terms of physical characteristics, they're very similar. They're pretty much the same height. Uh, the, the, uh, the Tar Heel is a little bit wider here over the coil. They're both attached with uh, the same mount. I would recommend the Diamond K400 mount for either of these. The Tar Heel uses a 3 8 by, what is it, the 3 8 by 24 thread, where the ATOS has a PL259. That's kind of where the similarities start to fork off in the road. In terms of band coverage, the Tar Heel will do 80 meters through 6 meters, where the ATOS will only do 40 through 6. In terms of whips, they're pretty much the same exact length. Uh, the, the ATOS might be maybe an inch longer. But one key feature that I like about the Tar Heel, I can put a quick disconnect on here, take this whip off, and use a longer whip if I want. This way I have more radiating element in the air. I'm using less turns of inductance and my signal goes out farther. So we can't do that with the Yesu. Another thing, if this whip breaks on the Yesu, I don't know how easily it'd be replaced. To be fair, I haven't used this antenna yet. I do wanna give a big shout out to my friend Sideboom for loaning me his ATOS to play with. Uh, I'm excited to get this on the air. The whip is, uh, rather whippy on the ATOS. Uh, it, it seems a little bit more rigid on the Tar Heel, but I suspect you'll probably have similar results. I know for a fact the Tar Heel can withstand 100 mile per hour winds. Uh, I would probably guess the uh, ATOS could as well. Now as far as controlling the antenna with the Tar Heel, you have to have some kind of external screwdriver antenna controller and they come in a couple different variations. This one that I currently have basically just controls the up or down and you've got 10 buttons to set memories. There's no RF sensing in this. I do have an RF sensing model that I'm gonna swap out for this that will kind of track the frequency of the radio better and adjust the uh, Tar Heel up or down uh, automatically, I, I believe, but the one that I have installed right now, you can either push the up or down buttons and you can see the numbers climbing and the antenna coil is raising, or you can save the presets and push the button and it'll automatically raise up to where you've had uh, the antenna tuned for resonance at. So that's how you use the Tar Heel. Very, very simple. I mean, you saw how much effort I put into that. There is a little bit of fine tuning though. So usually 40 to 41 is around where I'm resonant on 20 meters, but depending if I'm higher in the band or lower in the band, you might need to just kind of give it a quick touch up or down to just kind of find that sweet spot for lowest SWR, where the ATOS will do everything automatically. So let me show you that. Now tuning is really where the ATOS is gonna shine. We don't need any control boxes. We don't need to wire anything extra. All you do is plug the coax from the antenna into your radio and you are almost done. The only other thing we have to do is deal with Yesu's stupid menu system. So we're gonna hold down the function button and we're gonna to scroll to menu 5-12, which is ATOS settings. We're gonna push our multi knob. We're gonna turn it to enable, push your knob again. And then we have to go all the way down to menu 16-15, because why would Yesu put 
the two functions for their antenna together. We're going to go to 1615 for tuner select. We're going to push the multi knob. We're going to change that to ATOS. We're going to press the multi function button again. We're going to press function to get out of it. Now we have ATS right here. We can do a couple things here. We can scroll to function menu one. And in the top left where it says TNR, we can press the multifunction knob or we can long press one of our ABC buttons and that will save it to uh, the kind of a, 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 ma a main button here. Now, for some reason, when I did this originally, you push the tune button, it doesn't do anything. It should just work. If for some reason this doesn't automatically work, but look, it's tuning right now. It says high SWR and it only takes a second. So right now the antenna is lowering because I had it tuned on 40. You just saw the SWR go down, now it's tuned. If for some reason that doesn't work, I found that hitting the PTT is actually gonna kind of jumpstart it to work because I was having a dickens of a time. I was pushing the tune button, the ATS thing was blinking and it wasn't actually doing anything. You should see that SWR graph move. So I, I keyed up and it started working. But from there on in, we're done. If I want to change frequencies around 20, whatever, push tune, there it goes again. Maybe I want to go to 40, push tune, it's going to do that again. Now keep in mind, you are tuning up. So it is sending out a carrier. So be mindful of uh, keying up on other people. But this thing is freaking awesome. It sends the voltage through the coax, no wiring, no nothing. You just plug in the antenna and you are good to go. Now, interesting side note with the ATOS antenna, I had a couple problems initially setting it up where it wouldn't actually do anything to the antenna. Uh, the, the ATS thing would blink on the screen, but the antenna was not moving up or down. After filming that little clip, I took the Tar Heel off my car and just have the ATOS set up because I wanted to drive around and, and use that for, for a couple weeks, and it will not tune. It just doesn't work. I don't know what the deal is. I tried searching online. Um, I suspect it's probably something I'm doing wrong, but there's literally only two steps to getting that antenna to work. So I have no idea if you guys have had similar issues with the ATS blinking and no tuning happening, like there's, there's no power coming out. I don't know what the deal is. Um, usually the SWR will go up and it'll, you'll, you'll see it go down. The antenna is not going up or down anything. So anyway, uh, it appears that the ATOS is not quite as plug and play as that clip just uh, made it look. So. I'm definitely sticking with the Tar Heel now because I know for a fact that thing works all the time. So take that for what it's worth. Last but not least, we have a great question that uh, has absolutely nothing to do with ham radio, but it has to do with stuff that I sure do like to talk about. This is from Phil Muth. He's a great uh, viewer of all of the YouTube uh, ham radio channels, a great supporter. Thanks, Phil. He says, with apologies to Monty Python, the Flying Circus, and now for something completely different. Let's talk rigs. I'm curious what you use for your guitar. Amps, pedals, etc. I know it's not ham related, but curious minds want to know. Thanks for your energy in each of your videos and the knowledge you share with the ham community. Phil, it would be my pleasure to show you my guitar rigs because I really do love talking music here too. As much as I love talking antennas, I love talking guitar and amps and all that stuff. So let's go into my music room and I'll show you what I got. Well, if you must know, for my guitar amp, I went with a Line 6. This is the Spider Valve Mark II, 100 watt head. They designed this with Bogner, so it's, it's got Bogner uh, tube stuff inside of it. There's four, I think there's six L6 power tubes and there's two 12AX7 preamp tubes. But then I also get, so I get the, uh, I get the, the warmth and the, and the delicious tone of a tube amp, but then I also get all the modeling software, different amp models, different cab models, different effects and all that uh, from Line 6. They're kind of the leader. And I can control all of this with a floorboard. There's a volume pedal and expression pedal and a bunch of buttons and banks and stuff. So uh, I don't need any other uh, effects pedals or anything like that other than I do use a, a crybaby wah wah pedal. So I like this. I tried a bunch of different amps and ended up settling on this. As far as speaker cabs, I'm using Mar two Marshall 412 cabs. These are the 1960s cabs with uh, Celestian vintage 30s in these. Uh, I got these for a steal. Best Buy was, was kind of doing a closeout on these because they, they were selling music equipment for a while. These cabs usually run for just under a thousand bucks retail. I got the pair for like 1100 bucks. So. Kind of had to go with that. As far as PA stuff, I never really splurged that much on that. I just wanted something that was loud enough to 
you know, jam in the basement with your crappy band and all that. So uh, both the tops, there's two 15s and a horn in here, and then I've got uh, a couple pairs of 18 inch subs. These are all PV, uh, just kind of cheapo base grade type stuff, but they, they do the job, they're loud enough. For mixing, I'm just using a Behringer Eurodesk. This is the SX2442, it's a 24 channel mixer. It's got two different uh, effects processors built in and uh, it, it works. It's, it's a pretty nice mixer, I like it. Behringer's not the top of the line by any means, but you know, for just someone who's kind of not a professional musician, this works great. I really like it. I've had this for, oh gosh, probably 10 or so years now at least, and it's been, uh, been working very well for me. From the mixer, pretty basic. I've got two power amps. These are both uh, Mackies. This is an M1400, and then this is a uh, M1400i. Pretty much the same amp, just made in a different year. And pretty basic, just a compressor and a noise gate and, uh, and a crossover to split the channel between the subs and the mains. I used to have an effects processor here, but I don't remember what happened. I think it was my brother's, I had to give it back to him. And then this is the rack for my guitar. I've just got a power conditioner here. And then this is for my wireless. This is a Shure QLXD. And uh, I've got a Korg rack mount tuner. And then this is just for a uh, kind of a, a more lower end uh, wireless mic just to have one of those. As far as vocal mics, I'm a Shure fanboy, so I use a Shure Beta 58 for vocals, and then here's the uh, wireless that I use for Shure with a SM58 capsule. Now as far as guitars are concerned, I have five. Uh, I've got a couple acoustics. The first one, this is an Ovation, just a cheapo. I think it's, I think it's their G series, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, this is something my uh, uncle found at a garage sale and picked it up, I think he paid like $100 for it. It sounds beautiful. It's a nightmare to play like every other Ovation because the bottom is round, so they're pretty uncomfortable, but their, their sound is kind of unmatched in the industry, but it's a cool little guitar. Next is my other acoustic. This is something I bought, oh gosh, years and years ago when I lived in Virginia. I just wanted a, a basic, I don't, I don't play a lot of acoustic guitars, so I don't really care about spending money on one. It was, it was a couple few hundred dollars, but uh, this is an electric acoustic. It's got some uh, EQ up here. That sounds beautiful I, for how much I paid. I think I paid 250 bucks for this. Um, and it just sounds amazing. It plays amazing. I, I probably spent about six months going to the stores looking for acoustic guitars and uh, played a lot of them, played some more expensive ones and actually settled on this. It's not always about cost. This one actually just, it, it spoke to me. So that's my other acoustic. Takamine or Take Mine or Takamini, however you want to say it. I don't know. That's what it is. Now for the cool stuff, I am a huge Gibson Les Paul fanboy. Uh, this is my first Gibson Les Paul. This is a 93. Uh, I got this for Christmas one year when I was like 12. And uh, I wanted to be like Slash, so I wanted to get a Les Paul. And this is the first one that I got. I've customized everything on it. There's not a single thing that's stock other than the body and the neck. Uh, new hardware, new pickups. I got a Duncan Distortion in here. I've got an Alnico 2 Pro in here. I'm sure I've re replaced the bridge and saddle at some point. Black toggle switch, chrome tuners, uh, just a blank truss rod cover there. It used to say standard. So this is a Gibson Les Paul standard. This is the very first one. This is taking some beatings and uh, yeah, it's, it's wearing away the paint on the neck and stuff and paint's cracking up here, but those are all just battle scars. I love this guitar. This is freaking amazing. Next is my Red Les Paul. I bought this, uh, this is an 05, and I bought this. I had a really, really big sale, and I used some of my commission to buy this. I wanted another Les Paul, and I wanted to just have one that was totally stock, so I haven't changed anything on here other than, I put Schaller strap locks on all my guitars so they don't fall, but uh, yeah, I just, I love the, the wine red color of this. I, I went through a lot of different Les Pauls before I settled on this one. I wasn't really caring about the color so much. I just wanted it to play and, and sound right. And uh, I went from the 60s necks, the 50s necks, settled on the 50s neck. I like them, they're a bit fatter. And uh, yeah, that's my other Les Paul. But wait, there's more. This is my absolute favorite guitar. This is a 1988, I feel, if I could see. Uh, no, this is a 1989 Gibson Les Paul Custom. Uh, it's kind of bittersweet. My uncle passed away. He owned this and uh, I got this in the will. He had a bunch of other guitars. Me and my cousin kind of split up his music collection. Um, but I ended up with the, with the Les Paul Custom. I absolutely love this. 
It blows the doors off of the standards. This is the main guitar that I pick up when I want to play. It's just, it feels the best, it sounds the best, it plays the best. Uh, and it was my uncle's, so there's that sentimental attachment to it. Haven't really changed anything on it other than putting the Schaller strap locks on it. Uh, typically I take off the pit guards. I'm leaving this one on because it's, it's my uncle's. So he would have wanted it that way. So that's what we're going to do. So that's my stuff. And that is going to do it for this week's Mailbag Monday, number 14. Again, guys, if you have questions, shoot me an email, k8mrd at icloud.com. In the description, put Mailbag Monday, and I will at least see it and potentially read it and even less potentially <laughs> feature it on the channel. <laughs> We've got uh, 13 back uh, videos now, so there's there's a lot of topics that we've covered. I try and put all the topics in the uh, description there and, and have chapters and, and such, so you should be able to find stuff pretty easy. But anyway, uh, thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you again on another episode of KMRD Radio Stuff. 73, guys. Uh -huh.